Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to our online program of the Michelle Miao Show with the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Michelle Miao, host and producer of the program, and also a member of the Board of Governors for the Commonwealth Club of California. The Commonwealth Club has produced over 400 virtual programs since the start of the pandemic, and we hope to see you soon for an in-person program, and I know that that is going to come very soon. I'm super excited about it, but in the meantime, we are very, very grateful for your support. So if you wish to do so, please donate to the Commonwealth Club of California. You can click on that blue donate button on the YouTube screen, or you can head to the Commonwealth Club's website at commonwealthclub.org. Also, don't forget to send us your questions if you have them. I'll be sure to get them to our speakers, as, as many as I can. Um, and you can do that through the chat box there next to your screen. It's my honor to introduce to you the program this afternoon, Deadly Legacy, the Vietnam War's Unexploded Ordinance. From 1964 to 1973, the U.S. dropped more than 2 million tons of ordnance on Laos during over 580,000 bombing missions, making Laos the most heavily bombed country per capita in history. The bombings were part of the U.S. secret war in Laos to support the Royal Lao government. The bombings destroyed many villages and displaced hundreds of thousands of Laos civilians during the nine-year period. So here to speak about the secret war and the unexploded ordinance are a group of very passionate speakers who have been educating the public about the history as well as being active themselves in clearing parts of Laos that still affected. We have Sarah Gulaptara, beautiful last name. I have to tell you that some other time or she will, what uh, those two words mean in Lao, but she's the executive director of Legacies of War. We also have Colonel Kao, uh, I'm sorry, Ying Si Siang Mai, who's the former, a formal Royal Lao Army Colonel, David Pomovong, who's co-founder of the Laotian American National Voice, also co-chair of the Secret War Veterans Benefit, uh, and also a member of the Lao Global Heritage Alliance uh, and Board of Directors. <laughs> and we also have former operations officer of the CIA, Thomas Leo Briggs, who's also a former special agent for the DEA, and also a former military police pl platoon leader for the U.S. Army. So welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We'll begin with Tom. Tom, let's start with your personal story of how you got involved with the CIA and its secret operation in Laos. Well, thanks, Michelle, uh, and thanks to you and the Commonwealth Cl Club for giving me this opportunity to appear here. I, I want to note that I'm a private citizen, and any statements of fact, opinion, or analysis are my own, and they don't reflect the official positions of any United States government agency. Uh, my presence also results from my position as president of the Coalition of Allied Vietnam War Veterans as a volunteer, one who owes a debt of honor to my former comrades in arms to help them here in the United States. I actually got involved when I met Colonel Cow here in Washington, D.C. a few years ago when he was here with a group uh, doing some lobbying with the Congress. And my, my uh, participation with them dates from that time. Uh, I think you've asked me to talk about the purpose of CIA in Laos. And I would say that the first thing is that the CIA carries out the requirements given it to it by the United States government you, from the president uh, on down. Uh, and their requirements uh, for Laos came from, that, from the president. Uh, President Eisenhower actually began covert operations in Laos during his term of office from 52 to 1960. And then uh, Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon continued that support. Um, President Kennedy had a chance to speak directly with President Eisenhower before the handover, and Eisenhower convinced uh, JFK that this was an important area of the country that needed uh, the U.S. support. Um, a lot of information can be found, if you're interested, in the Office of the Historian Department of State Foreign Relations of the United States, usually called FRUS. And that's a good source for background information on some of this, uh, what, I've, what I've just said. 
Um, Laos uh, was divided by the by the Kingdom of Laos into five military regions. The most important ones uh, for the war were MR2, which is was in the north, uh, in uh, Hmong territory, and uh, their mission there was to defend defend the Plain of Jars. I'm using the, my English pronunciation. I'm not good at French. Uh, we just call it the PDJ. Um, and the, the, the idea was that the threat from North Vietnam was to follow an ancient uh, invasion route over the PDJ uh, to the Vientian, over the Mekong and into Thailand. And um, the uh, government was very concerned about that threat. And the initial involvement of the Lao people was through the Hmong, through General Vang Pao and Bill Lair, they organized um, the Hmong into a group that could defend that PDJ. Um, I would say that the Hmong and the other northern Lao mountain tribes probably consisted of about 35 to 40 percent of the total guerrilla forces in Laos. I don't know the exact numbers. Nobody does. But that's a pretty decent estimate. And contrary to mm, the current situation with the media and politicians who think that the Hmong were the only people that fought in Laos, that's not correct. Um, to move on to who else fought, MR3 and MR4 were in the south, and that was uh, uh, organized around the city of Savaniket and the city of Pakse. Um, the, the, the mission was to interdict the flow of men, arms, and materiel through the Kingdom of Laos, an independent country, uh, into the Republic of Vietnam, an independent country, and to protect the main cities of southern Laos, uh, all of them. I mean, it would be Savaniket and Pak Song, but uh, Pak Se, Pak Song, and some of the other uh, towns. Um, along that Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is what we're talking about, there were at least 69,000 North Vietnamese Army soldiers, 9,000 Patet Lao, and 30 North Vietnamese Army battalions and, and a vast array of anti-aircraft anti artillery. The, the soldiers in MR3 and 4 consisted mostly of the Lao from, from the lowlands, we always call the lowland Lao, and Lao mountain tribes, a variety of them. They probably totaled 65, 60 to 65% of the total until we started in, in probably in the mid 70s to add uh, Thai SGU battalions that were volunteer battalions that were recruited and trained to help. Uh, the war had gone on so long, there was a lot of attrition, especially among the Hmong in the north and also uh, in, in the rest of the, the Lao nation. Um, there, there really were two battlefronts in Laos. A lot of people don't understand this. Uh, Laos is divided almost in half by the Anamite Mountains that runs north to south. That's where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was. They were using an area not very well populated that they could easily uh, send their, build their roads and use their trucks and use boats on the rivers and that sort of thing. Um, the eastern side of the Anamites was one war, and that was MACV in Vietnam's air interdiction campaign against the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And also MACV SOG, which is the Studies and Observation Group, they conducted activities into Laos from Vietnam, but there was a restriction on them as an agreement between the um, ambassador to Laos and the commander, commanding general of MACV that they could only go so far into Laos. So that's your one half of the war in Laos. Uh, the other half was the, the CIA operation to defend the, PDG, the <clears throat> PDJ and uh, the overall SGU interdiction of the Ho Chi Minh Trail and defense of Laos cities. Air support to, to the SGU was close support of troops. We, we called it TIC, Troops in Contact and um, also air mobile support. I read somewhere, I, I don't have the citation, a statement along the lines of the Laos special guerrillas were the only guerrilla force in history with an air mobile transportation and a fighter bomber close support. Very unusual in the world of guerrillas and, and special operations. Um, my role uh, in um, in Laos, uh, I, I, they, I had no choice of my assignment. I received a letter from the CIA saying they thought I might have skills they were interested in. 
please go to Philadelphia and apply. I did. And that commenced a, a year of training resulting at the end in, in being told they'd like to assign me to Laos. And that was fine with me because the alternate was for me to go to Vietnam and that was non-accompanied and uh, I would, we would be able to take, we could take uh, wives and children to Laos. And I was, I had gotten married in August and I was leaving in February. So I was happy. I got to Laos and I had no real choice as to what I would do. I was assigned to small team operations. Um, and that, that was in, involved recruiting soldiers to join our, our group. I had about, we eventually called it Team 300, which didn't apply to the 300 men. It, it came from another, for another reason, but I had about 300 men. Uh, we trained them, we gave them missions, transported them behind enemy lines, communicated and resupplied with them, often by parachute drop. We transported them back out of the field, debriefed them, reported intelligence, maintained a safe base camp between missions and provided medical care for the soldiers and, the, and their families. Um, I never lost a man in combat while I was there, mostly because we were true guerrillas. I told the men, look, you get confronted by the enemy, you retreat, you run away, whatever, you survive. I don't want you to get killed. I need, I need you to conduct the missions, not to fight with the enemy and get killed. And uh, that's an easy reason to say, well, we, I mean, you could still lose people in combat, but uh, you have a lot less chance than my comrades among the other case officers. They were uh, advising and working with battalions and regiments and they had much greater chance and in fact did lose a lot of their men. Uh, moving on, you, I was, you asked me about personal accounts. Uh, the job that I got when I, I arrived had to do with counting trucks on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I thought was a totally useless uh, thing to do. And so I started looking for other things. I was interested in the uh, collection of intelligence in a behind the lines, special operation, operations, guerrilla type of environment. I wasn't interested in being uh, one of the leaders of, a, of a, uh, one of Colonel Kaus um, battalions or regiments. Um, and so I dug into what I had, started analyzing things, and we started to change the operations to collecting intelligence uh, send a team out, talk to the villagers, find out where the enemy was, find the enemy location, and then report back to us so we could pass it to a forward air controller who could go out and find that location. And once he found it, direct bomb strikes on it. Um, I considered that one of the best things that, that we did. Um, we employed some unusual new things like we trained the team to use a signaling mirror that way, when the team was out in the field, they were under a, a canopy of trees, and but they could use the mirror to flash it at, at the forward air controller. He would spot that flash, and then they would say, okay, now from that flash, go on this direction, 100 degrees, 180 degrees on a compass. He flew down on the level of the treetops until he found the target, and then he would call in the air support from the Air Force or the Navy or whoever. In the most successful part of that operation, um, we blew the side of a mountain off when, when they sent a, a missile right into a cave, uh, which then blew up everything inside it. Um, we did some intercepting of logistical reporting. The North Vietnamese couldn't uh, report all the way from South Vietnam or Laos all the way to Hanoi, and they used relays. And we, uh, discovered a way that we could put a team on a top of a mountain and intercept those communications, which were in Vietnamese, but we could turn them over to translators. They could be translated. And what we were getting was the uh, uh, report of the monthly flow of men and material and supplies north and south. Uh, a little bit reminiscent of what we did to the Germans in World War II when we were intercepting Rommel's logistical reports and figuring out what, what was going on. Uh, we also uh, tried to recruit NVA soldiers to um, report to us. Uh, 
we had a team that was able to find a North Vietnamese soldier who was very homesick and, and was willing to try to cooperate with us so we would help him get out of there. Unfortunately, he was discovered before anything really happened, but it was as close as anyone that ever worked in Laos ever got to actually recruiting a North Vietnamese soldier while he was still at his unit. And the last thing I would mention is that um, I would ask some of the other case officers, uh, I don't want to do this truck counting. What else could I do? What would be a good thing? And they said, well, ha, 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 capture a North Vietnamese soldier, which wasn't too like that. That isn't, wasn't a likely thing to happen. Well, we started to work on it. And uh, eventually we were able to either capture, physically capture or induce to defect uh, 17 North Vietnamese army soldiers. Um, some, one of the things is that when you see special operations in the movies and on TV, you see all Americans. Sometimes you might see a mixture group, but there's American always there. We had no Americans. We, these, the, 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 the Lao soldiers were clever. They knew the, the terrain. They knew what was going on and they would go out and they would discover that there was a guy that would make a regular bicycle trip between two villages. So they set up a little ambush and they, a guy jumped up and said, could you stop? Could you stop? And they, when the guy stopped, they all came out and jumped on him and knocked him down threw his bicycle into the weeds and took off to meet us and get helicoptered out. Uh, another, another team uh, managed to attend a, a wedding in the local village where they proceeded to, they knew there would be some North Vietnamese soldiers there. They got them drunk and then they grabbed one and, and uh, went off into the jungle with him. Uh, that type of, type of thing, it, it's not easily done when you're a big white foreigner in a foreign country, but it sure is easily done by, by your local uh, guerrilla soldiers that are, that are working with you. Um, I, I uh, as my own personal position is, I think that uh, that was one of the things I was proudest of. We produced a lot of intelligence from those soldiers. We brought them in. And one other thing I would mention, when we brought them in, they had to be blindfolded because they couldn't see. I was on uh, the, the helicopter and they couldn't see that there was an American there. We would turn them over to the Lao, uh, the Royal Lao government, the Royal Lao Army. They would go into the Lao in interrogation process and then working with a different case officer who was working to make the interrogation better, the intelligence would be produced. And there was a lot of interesting intelligence that came out of those captured NVA and defectors. And Thank I think so I'm hitting coffee. 15 minutes. So there you go. <laughs> Well, we, we want to. Yeah, I know we have a lot to cover and we have a, a lot to talk about. And so uh, we'll eventually be able to have a conversation as a group. But let's hear from Colonel Cal, uh, especially around you know your perspective in serving for the Royal Lao Army and and also being a Lao person and then, you know, supporting the CIA in its mission. So let's hear your story, Colonel Cal. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Michelle, thank you, David, and Mr. Tom Brick, and the lady with uh, that last name. So I appreciate you asking, asking me to come and talk. And one thing why I go back to the French accent, somebody, you know, understand my English. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I fought during the war since I was 18 years old. But let me introduce myself. My name is Pao in Chiang Mai. I'm a former special guerrilla unit, SCU, surviving colonel and commander of the special guerrilla unit, Group Man Mobile, Dr. GM, number 33, a unit recruited, trained, supported, and directed by CIA case officer in Laos. I am a U.S. citizen living in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. I received my military training in Laos, France, and in the U.S. In the United States, I went through the English advanced class to learn U.S. military terminology at Lackland Air Force Base, Texas at the U.S. Army Armor School 
for Knox, Kentucky. I went through the special leadership course, which is like the officer basic training. I attended the N23 officer advanced course at Fort Benning, Georgia, which helped me to become a strong unit commander. At the end of 1960, when Savannah forces defeated the coup d'etat set by Captain Kong Le, second airborne battalion commander, the nation needed officer. I applied to become a military cadet and was sent to Vientiane, the capital of Laos. The training lasted only one year and I volunteered to join the Royal Lao Airborne Brigade. After finishing the airborne training, I first assigned to, the, to be a platoon leader of the 1st Airborne Battalion of the 15 Airborne Brigade, brigade and was sent to North Lao, Long Nam Tha province. Our unit was to stop the Chinese in the North Vietnamese army aggression along with the party Lao, that's the Lao communists. At the battle, I knew that the Chinese and the North Vietnamese are stronger than my unit. They use different strategy and different kind of warfare. And they were too smart and brave. On May 17, 1962, at 4.25 p.m., I was wounded and captured. Do you know how I remember the time when they shoot at me, five of them point the bayonet on my chest? They say, kill him, kill him. They say in Vietnamese, banjet, banjet. So I look at my watch. So that's 425 on the 17th. So I take notes. So after three months, I escaped from the prison of war camp. Now I will talk about why the CIA recruited me. After the graduation ceremony of the Commando Platoon, Commando Rider Platoon, who finished the airborne training offered by the Airborne Training Center, I was I run the Airborne Training Center. The CIA invited me to attend, you know, the event, the ceremony. And the CAC that uh, at that time, 1967, very few people speak English, and I was able to speak English and able to train the troop, the airborne, you know, commando radar. So they asked me to join. It takes me two months before I joined the CIA because, you know, I was a good person from the Royal Army and they said, why take him away from our training center? So on March 18, 1968, I was recruited by the Savannakate CIA Military Region Street Headquarters from the Royal Lao Army to serve with the Special Guerrilla Unit. That's a surrogate of the U.S. government. Because of my unique skill, Cap capacity. During my six years working with the CIA, case officer, many things happen. You know, as today, when I think about the war in Laos, so I fought many years. I was tortured, I was captured. Mostly I cried. You know, that's something that too much. For me, from 18 years old, I, I did not know nothing except go to fight and they shoot at me. I was wounded and then that's my life was really terrible, you know, terrible. And the second time, two years, it was terrible with my family too. So on August 6, 1968, Lieutenant Colonel Wayne McNulty, the first CIA kill in action by enemy gunfire in Laos was standing close to me, next to me. He get up the chopper to bring the right to my battalion. 
Then he get out of the chopper and he stand uh, next to me. And then I told him that, oh, the enemy is around us. You better get out of the chopper and go away. Then in a sudden, the North Vietnamese army shoot at us and it hit right on to his head. And then he get on the airplane and later on I found out that he was killed. And on January 18, 1969, I secured one U.S. Air Force CH-3 Jolly Green 67, a helicopter with a crew of five that landed because of the engine problem in Mueang Plan, military region three, central part of Laos. I know, I still know the names. The crew members were Darati, the pilot, Libby, the co-pilot, Purdue, flight engineer, Pop, rescue man in Johnson, rescue man. On August 1969, I was seriously severely wounded by a hand grenade while leading one MR3 Blue, Blata Blue Battalion and one MR2 SEU Battalion in cutting the North Vietnamese Army round number seven from North Vietnam to Plan of Char, the PDC in MR2. This mission allowed the main offensive forces to recapture the plane of charge. The SEU captured 800 tons. That's good for three months, good for three months supply for the NVA. On March 1972, I led the operation of 250 men of my GM to retake the PDJ occupied by two North Vietnamese division. This, despite of the retreat of eight SU GM, four GM from MR2, two GM from MR3, and one GM from MR4, and also one GM from MR1. So when the chief of CIA in many loud general, including General Wang Pao, you know, come, came to see me. I have only 20, 151 men. General Pao asked me in front of many large generals and the chief of CIA, that's a huge tower. Are you able to go back to PDJ with 251 men? And I was a soldier, an officer. I said, yes, sir, I will go. But that's very terrible. 250 versus 25,000. I was like I was in the, the ocean with small boat, but I did it, you know. We killed many North Vietnamese at that time too. I have to do it because I want to show that the Lao soldiers are stronger, smarter, with discipline and skill, more than the North Vietnamese. And that was our hometown, our country. I did it instead of, you know, getting scared all the time. That's very, very scary, in fact, you know, but I did it. On June, one other, on June 1972, the GM, my GM, you know, had to go and retake Kung Sedon back. Kung Sedon, the city located in MR4, uh, on round number seen, that's a divide. Uh, Savannakit and Paxi province. So the unit inflicted heavy casualty on North Vietnamese. The first three weeks, we killed 300 North Vietnamese. Then after three months, we killed almost the Vietnamese who occupied uh, Kong Sedon, one and a part of uh, one of the 1939 regiment. And the regiment commander was killed. We we tried to kill all of them. And the CIA said, don't kill, capture some. And we captured 17 of them. So the the NVA saw that that occupied Kung Sedon were killed. And then 
During that time, General Wesley, who was military assistance group that time, and later on he was the chairman, Choi Chief of Staff, went to see my operation and with uh, Chairman Sutjai, because when I attacked the North Vietnamese, they want me to use the airstrike. I say, no, I don't want to use it. They ask me why. The North Vietnamese do not have the air support. That's not fair. I will attack them by my weapons. So I finish it, and it makes that uh, the Lao so then now become stronger than the North Vietnamese. It is published in many secret war in Laos, CIA document, in many books saying that you know, GM-33 was the best soldier in Laos. Thank you for my men. And we lost, you know, during the time I was in Baxi area, I lost 500 killed and 1,000 wounded. And maybe some, you know, missing in action. So the war in Laos, people do not understand that even it's, it's a small war, secret war, but we lost 50,000 men killed in Laos, 600 American servicemen, 2,500 Thai troops, and uh, 5,000 South Vietnamese troops killed uh, when they tried to block the Ho Chi Minh Trail at round number nine. So we suffer a lot. And to me, I feel that, uh, you know, we, we are not well recognized by, you know, the people here. I mean, the American Congress or politician or maybe young Lao people because they do not really know the history of the secret war in Laos. You know, the 50,000 Lao soldiers who killed and mostly try to block the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You know, it saved American life in South Vietnam. You know, the blood we shed, more, more than 50,000 and about 100,000 got wounded, saved maybe, I do not know, maybe 50,000 US life in South Vietnam or South Vietnam you know, life. You know, talking about the war in Laos, the Laos soldier has only around 50,000 men. 38,000 belong to the special area unit. What? We lost the total of 50,000. You know, that's a too many compared to, you know, American forces who were in South Vietnam for 55,000 and South Vietnamese took 1.2 million and, you know, Allied forces, 70,000 from Thailand, from Australia and from South Korea. So this is something I did. If I say it's going to be too long, you know, it takes me seven years to fight. And then I, I fought almost every place in Laos, you know, including northern part of Laos. Uh, the PD chair two times, and a lot of time in Savanakit, two times in Pakse, and you know that's a hor horrible time for me. You know, and right now, my friend who fought, most of them passed away already. Very few left. You know, even myself, I have my PTSD. My heart problem and, you know, a lot of things happened to me. And then when I, think, when I think back, I think, what happened? What happened to Laos? You know, you know, why there is a war? Why there was a war? Why we kill each other? Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I send them fight uh, the Patila, the Lao communists, because even... We run into the patilla, we say, go away. I don't want to fight you. You are loud like me. I want to fight those who who invaded Lao, you know. Mm -hmm. What for the Lao? You are safe with me. 
So this is what I I work with the CIA. That's a long history, you know, because I taught heavy weapons. I taught even sniper, you know, dump some uh, fraud, uh, you know, hand grenade on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and go insert the small team and go extract the small team. So I know the Ho Chi Minh Trail from in MR3 and in MR4. So that's, uh, you know, what I want to say now is I need the U.S. government to, to treat the Laos soldier fairly. Mm-hmm. I want the young people to understand the war in Laos. Uh, we know that uh, the blood that we shed, the tear we shed, paid the way for the Lao young nation to come here. You know, because I, I worked since 2005 to ask the Lao community across this nation. I travel a lot. And they say, oh, I come here because of the United Nations, not from you. And I feel like, uh, you know, that's the world forgotten by everybody, even the Lao community, you know. That's something that that's not fair. And then I want the youngest generation in American politicians to understand. You know, well, you know, we're recognizing it. you this afternoon, Colonel Cow, and thank you so much for your service. And thank you to Tom as well. And I know David will talk a, a little bit later about some efforts to recognize veterans such as yourself and, and go beyond that. Um, I, I definitely want to thank you so much for sharing your story. And we've got a little bit of time left in which I want to turn our attention to Sarah, who serves as the executive director for Legacies of War. So we just heard two powerful stories, Sarah, and how, uh, you know, the perspectives of what, carrying out the mission during wartime. But I'd love to hear from you how that has impacted, you know, Lao people, right? I said earlier in my introduction, it has displaced many Lao people, but also that the impact is worldwide. It has reached even a community here in the United States who want to do something about the unexploded ordinance. Sarah? Yes, thank you. I want to thank Mr. Rick who helped me for almost 10 years. When I went to DC and I asked something about the war, he's the person who helped me a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rick. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michelle and Commonwealth Club for having me today. Um, And hello to everyone out there tuning in. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to our story. Um, So as Michelle mentioned, um, Legacies of War is an organization. We're actually the only U.S.-based organization um, that is focused on educational and advocacy efforts um, to tell the story of the secret war, as well as to advocate for U.S. funds for the removal of UXO and victims' assistance. So, Michelle, to answer your questions regarding the impact of the people of Laos, then as well as now, um, you know, because this is still a very real problem today, um, to take our viewers back in time, um, you know, during the time of the Secret War, the nine years, 1964 to 1973, um, Michelle mentioned that the U.S. carried out 580,000 bombing missions, dropping over 2.1 million tons of ordnance. That's an equivalent of a plane load of bombs every for 24 hours, like every eight minutes. Um, for 24 hours a day, nine years straight. That's a lot of bombs, right? Um, When you look at the people of Laos during that time, it was roughly around 2.2 million people. One third of that were displaced, losing their homes, you know, didn't really know what was going on. The nearly 90% of the casualty were actually civilians and not the target, um, the targeted um, Vietnamese that the, the bombs were meant for. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, folks, you know, really, really know um, the impact that this has had on people during that time. Um, Refugees were fleeing from their home into the capital. Um, And there were just so, so many things, you know, in addition to the lives that were lost. um, I would also like to highlight historical sites, you know, um, Tom mentioned the Plain of Jars. Much of that has been destroyed during the war. Um, Ethnic tribal groups, you know, I would really want to quote uh, Fred Brantman, who was an American activist and educator during that time. You know, he mentioned that ethnic groups were wiped off the face of this planet during that time. 
much of Laotian history, you know, then and to some um, to some respect now has been oral history that is also lost right but you know I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that one did survive um, and I'm holding voices from the plane of jars this is the reason why legacies was actually found um, to tell a quick story our founder Jennifer Kamusa um, met with John Cavana who is uh, the executive director of IPS or Institute for Policy Studies um, back in the early 2000 right and he handed her the original drawings that are depicted in this book um, I'll share a few of them uh, showing firsthand account of what these refugees who were fleeing was experiencing during the bombings um, you know, and, and the original drawings was handed over to Janapa, who, you know, as a young Lao American, didn't really know the details of the history of the secret war. So she knew that if she didn't know, other 1.5 generations, young Laotians, um, as well as the American public also would not know. So embarked on this journey and legacies was founded. Um, you know, this is one that, that um, asset that we have that we can continue to share um, and educate young Laotians to Colonel Kyle's point about, as well as Americans, because this is very much an American history as well. Um, you know, to talk about the impact that it has on today, this is still very, very real. Of the millions of bombs that were dropped, 30% failed to detonate on impact, meaning there's still bombs left in Laos to this day. Um, about 80 million of that is cluster bombs, which is the small bomb that looks like a tennis ball, right? Um, just earlier this year, five children were walking home from school in Vientiane province, which is the capital of Laos, the most highly populated area, an area where you would think that, you know, it has already been cleared. Well, they found a bomb and they started playing with it. Two of the children were immediately killed and the remaining three severely injured and they're probably not going to be able to walk to school ever again. So the problem still exists to this day. In addition to it harming children, land can't be released for farmers, right? When you look at, you know, our lives today, we're facing a pandemic, you know, adding the, the burden of experiencing COVID and just um, the, the difficulties that is posing on the people's lives in Laos in particular, people can't farm their land if lands aren't released to be cleared. For Americans here, right, and especially the diaspora community, um, uh, Colonel Kyle mentioned trauma. This is very, very real. And it is something that we're speaking about, about and we're also trying to address. Um, you know, I'll quote uh, Dr. Pukum Kelly, who um, says that, trauma, generational trauma, tend to last for about seven generations. We're barely, we're barely into the second generation, right? So this is gonna take a long time. You know, if, even though I didn't personally experience the war myself, I'm experiencing the trauma from my parents and my grandparents. Um, you know, and the refugees who are fleeing has to be able to um, make a new life, you know, in, in new home, whether that is the United States or Europe or other parts of the world. Sarah, I wanted to ask, you know, and this is part of my ignorance, too, and not knowing all of what the secret war was about. But with regards to the UXO situation and these bombs have not been you know, detonated or cleared, I mean, what efforts from the U.S. side, if any, you know, are, are there? Like, have there been any efforts to engage the United States military or army to go and clean up these the UXO situation in Laos? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So since the founding of Legacies, right, during that time, funding for UXO clearance from the USI was at about 3 million a year. To date, I'm proud to say that because of efforts of Legacies of War and other advocacy um, partners of ours, as well as the people who are calling their senators representative, we've been able to achieve a historic funding amount of 40 million a year. So um, to give you some context on that, 40 million a year sounds like a lot, right? But for us to drop, like the, the amount of money that it took to drop bombs on Laos per day, if you look at it from today's money, it was 17 million. So that is not huge at all. 
Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what progress we're able to do with that funding. Um, and, you know, just to also clarify, none of the money that Legacies of War advocate for um, comes to our organization. We're privately funded on a shoestring budget. So $40 million goes straight into the country for clearance efforts as well as victims assistance. Um, and that's going to organizations like UXO Lao, which is the national demining team, uh, Mine Advisory Group, um, Halo Trust, um, Norwegian People's Aid, um, HI, which is a humanity and inclusion, and, um, and a couple of other smaller groups. I would also say that the Lao government themselves has also deployed the Lao army to help with clearance efforts. Um, to date, those 30% of the bombs that didn't detonate, less than 1% has been cleared, despite our best efforts. Now, um, I know, you know what some folks might be thinking, like, how could that be, you know, for the past, um, how, since, let's just say, from 2004, since the founding of Legacies all the way to now, less than 1% does not sound like a lot. But I do want to really, really share that this is not for lack of efforts. It is very, very challenging in order to survey Laos. You know, Laos is not exactly a flat surface. There's mountains, there's vegetation that needs to be um, uh, cleared in order to make it safe for demining teams, you know, the men and women who are working hard every day. Um, in addition to trying to find and locate the bombs, to detonate the bomb is very, very dangerous. You know, if you go to our website, follow us on social media, there's actually um, clips uh, of our team working with our partners to show some of that detonation. Um, I would also mention too, in addition to trying to clear these UXO and other types of bombs um, and explosive, there's also um, this effort to teach Laotians, you know, especially children um, about mind risk education, meaning letting them know that this is not a ball, right? Like, and this is not a toy. If you see it, this is what you do. I tell an adult, you know, let them call the Clarence effort teams in order to remove it safely. Um, because I'm sad to say that even to this date, 40% of UXO tragedies are children who think that this is a toy. So ongoing conversations are happening on both sides, um, meaning the Lao government side, as well as our own US government. Um, and you know, I, I do think that we're moving towards that right direction, um, but there's still so much more that can be done. Um, and I think um, this might be something that we cover later on, but I do also want to share one quick thing that I think it's very important for folks to really know um, the Lao government wants this to be done, you know, wants this job to be done so that people can live in safety, farmers can farm their lands, children can walk to school safely. Um, at a national level, hundreds of countries have adopted uh, the sustainable development goals, and there are 17 of them, ranging from getting people out of poverty, clean water, and so on, right? Lao government made their own SDG 18, Sustainable Development Goal 18, which says that we wanna make Laos clear of unexplored ordinance by the year 2030. That is bold and that is exciting. And that's within my lifetime, right? <laughs> um, all of our lifetimes. Um, so I feel like this is something that they want to do. And in order to be good partners, you know, show our allies that we stay with them, we should really step up and commit to helping to like push for more funding, you know, increase funding so that the teams can expand and that we can get the job done efficiently and fast. Last question for you. Uh, I guess, you know, talking about the lasting impact, the, you, you kind of glazed over the environmental impact. And I know that that's, that's going to be a really long time before we can get to a place where we can consider Laos like hundred percent habitable in all parts of Laos. But what would you say, you know, as far as your perspective in hoping that this doesn't happen to another country or any other part of the world again. I just imagine like, you know, millions of bombs on a certain piece of land that will affect generations may not, maybe not be the, uh, the, the way to go, I guess, um, mm -hmm. in the future of what we hope. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, education is first and foremost. Um, Americans don't know this history. Lao Americans don't know this history. And even some folks who are living in Laos don't know this history. 
right? Um, and this is why legacies exist in order to really get the story out there to make sure that it never happens again, right? I think, you know, from, um, from that perspective, we need to do a better job. Um, and I'm sure, Michelle, um, you had Sarita on here before to talk about LASD's effort with the cultural bill. Um, you know, I think had that bill been passed and if curriculums were actually included in schools, that would be a dream. Um, but we don't just want to stop in California, right? Like we want this to be a nationwide effort to teach uh, people about this so that they can make better decisions if they are, um, if they end up being the leaders, making the decision makers of our country. Um, I also think that uh, action um, also speaks louder than words. We have to make sure that we, um, we show the world that we as Americans are the leaders in the human rights issue in making sure that um, something as simple as allowing a child to walk to school um, is, is what we stand for. And in order to do that, we have to really commit um, and commit financially to, to um, solve this problem that we were the cause of, as well as to show that we also recognize those who were our allies like Colonel Kyle, right? Um, one bill that my team and I are working on um, is, is one that it's, it would be a dream and it would be historic if it, if it passed, right? We're so thankful for Senator Baldwin uh, for partnering with us to introduce the Legacies of War and UXO Removal Act. Um, this bill states that for the next five years, $100 million would be allocated to demining efforts and survivor assistance in Laos, as well as Cambodia and Vietnam. So divided amongst those three countries. Second portion of the bill, equally as important, is the recognitions of Laotians, Vietnamese, Cambodians, as well as ethnic tribal members who fought alongside American troops receive the same recognition as our American veterans, right? Like we have to be able to take that bold stance uh, committing for a long term, right? Like five years and beyond, however long it takes to get this job done. But I believe if we increase funding, if we increase like um, our dialogue, like between Lao US in order to really, really help resolve this together, we can get the job done in the 2030 goal that the Lao themselves have set. Thank you so much, Sarah. And now to you, David, Sarah uh, just pointed out, you know, a lot of efforts in making right of the wrongs of the past. Love for you to talk about how we also, you know, come full circle for our veterans, such as Colonel Cal and Tom. Well, mainly Colonel Cal. So we're talking about Lao veterans. David? Yeah, so what, what we're working on is, is um, a kind of different piece of the story to the secret war. We, we can just call it the aftermath. Uh, those that are lucky enough to survive this egregious uh, event, uh, Colonel Cal's there's 50,000 men lost their lives and many others um, have been wounded or am I, um, you know, captured and tortured in prison camps. Uh, those are their lost stories. Uh, these are veterans that have served along with the CIA, uh, operated under CIA command. Uh, Thomas, uh, Mr. Briggs has been very generous with his time as our advisor. And so one of the things I, I do want to kind of point out here is, is that, you know, as much as we want to be able to say, hey, look, you know, let's clear all the UXOs in Laos and make it sure it's safe. Obviously, we care about the children's lives, farmers' lives, especially when they're out there plowing the field and they hit something metallic and all of a sudden they're blinded or, you know, if they're lucky, they'll survive it. If they're unlucky, they, they would um, perish from it. Um, we have unsung heroes, forgotten heroes here uh, in the United States. And I'm talking about a secret war of veterans. So we've been in this country for 40 years. And a lot of the, um, the previously passed legislation, some of it is resolutions, is what we call mm, ceremonial in, in nature. Uh, some of the more tangible ones would be um, uh, the, the National Cemetery, uh, Arlington National Cemetery, has a monument uh, to recognize uh, Alao veterans who fought uh, in the Secret War. So that was back in 1997. And then a decade after that, uh, you know, you see other resolutions being passed as well too, but mostly just recognition saying, oh yeah, yeah, we recognize that you were there, uh, that you fought along with the CIA. But when it comes down to it, 
what does, how does that really help our veterans? It really doesn't. Palum Kao is a veteran. Is he getting veterans benefit? No, he's not. And many others, uh, our veterans, are not getting benefits either. So what we're trying to do, and, and I want to make this very, very clear, the United States law, and this is identified by the research from Mr. Briggs as well as uh, Colonel Cal. They've been working together for many years. So I'm, I'm like the newbie on board, right? So they just wanted to find a pretty face behind the bill. Uh, I think they have both failed. Um, but, you know, just, just to kind of point things out here, uh, and this is a lot of research by these gentlemen, you know, the law currently fails to recognize the extent of all covert activities conducted in, in the Southeast um, Asia from 1945 to 1975. Uh, the law also does not specify the requirements for documenting services as veterans. And so this is one area that's uh, critical to our bill. And the reason why this is going to be paramount in, in the way that they're trying to pass this legislation here is that, you know, as we all come to the refugee camp, right, we left everything behind, everything behind. We came with just the shirts on our back. So I kind of joke in many ways that when we came to the refugee camp, many of us were born again because we didn't bring birth certificates. We did not bring proper documentation to passports. And when you don't have these things in order, you go through the vetting period. Some people get a different birthday, right? Some of us don't even know our true birthdays because we don't have records for it. Now, Take that small, narrow scope, now apply it to the Secret War veterans, like Mr. Briggs had mentioned here. Documentation has always been one of the things that were not um, at the forefront of covert operations mind, right? For whatever reason, uh, we know some of the reasons for it, uh, but at the same time, now this is now beginning to work against the veterans. So how many of our Secret War veterans out there in the United States today you know, one of the projections we have come across is about 3,500 uh, surviving veterans, right, out of the 50,000 that uh, Lu Cao mentioned. And it's a mixed bag of uh, Lao, Mian, Hmong, Khmer, Kamu, um, veterans that have fought in the secret war. What we aim to do is address some of these um, problems of legislations that have been passed. And the more recent one was passed in 2018. Uh, this railroad bill was passed in, on a very, very narrow focus. It was so narrow that, in fact, it left a lot of, of you know, Lao veterans out and a lot of Hmong veterans out. And just to give you the viewing audience here, what that means is you, in order to qualify for the burial rights, you had to have been naturalized under the Hmong Recognition Act in 2000. If you were a veteran and you were naturalized before 2000, or if you were naturalized after 2000, that means you don't qualify. So that window of time was open and it was shut very quickly, which left out a lot of our veterans. So Mr. Uh, Briggs and Kowloon Kao have been working very hard on this cleanup bill. And this cleanup bill is going to be a broader and more encompassing to the standpoint that the bill does not require you to be a U.S. citizen. The bill requires that you are either U.S. citizen or residential alien. And when it comes to documentation, uh, obviously the same story with the refugee experience. When we came to, to the refugee experience camps, we don't have a lot of documentation. So the veterans have it even worse. Some of them served in the military, but don't have the proper paperwork. And we can't seem to be tracking that down. So. Uh, it will be a, a point of, of definition uh, that we have to pass in this law, which means that you either have the original documents or you have your supervising uh, um, officer who can bow for you. And unfortunately, because some of our, our veterans have passed on, so we no longer have, uh, you know, colonels and major generals and things like that, you know, we're looking at possibly uh, our peers that serve a long line to vouch for their service. So Mr. Briggs and Paulo and Cal have done a, a really good job here in terms of helping to write a bill. <laughs> this should be written by legislators, right? But it's written by private citizens who are looking to provide burial rights to our veterans. 
And so what I'm reaching out for, to, to the viewing audience here is, is you know, we need you. Uh, in order for us to do this, we need public support. Uh, Paul Lung Kao mentioned earlier that the reason why we're here is because of their services. We all came as political asylees, you know, and, and we were wanted, we were hunted. Uh, we, if we did not escape the country, uh, my parents, your family, Michelle, and other families would have been taken to re-education camp. And as we all know, that's hard labor camps and only a small few people can, will survive. So all of us here in the United States, my generation uh, and millennials, we all are a great deal of gratitude uh, for Pulung Kao and all those who serve. Uh, and we need to kind of bring our, our energy uh, together. And Sarah, I, I would love to work with Legacies of War as well too, because that's the piece of the, the puzzle, I think, that we should not forget. Uh, yes, there are an exploded ordinance. Yes, there are children still being harmed in Laos, but at the same time, we have a very short window of time here to make sure we get legislation passed uh, to provide burial rights to our veterans that are surviving currently today. Thank you so much, David. And I think, you know, what our conversation and all of your contributions today has highlighted for our viewers and for those who are learning about the secret war or learning about wars period is that, mm -hmm. you know, we are all existing in the realities of our history. However, we also can make decisions that make it a better tomorrow for all of us. And I think that's all of what you're all doing in terms of educating folks and putting bills forward um, and ensuring that our community members are healthy and whole. Uh, just very quickly before we say goodbye to our audience, Sarah, I wanted to make sure that people knew where to find information for Legacies of War. Absolutely. Um, folks can follow us uh, at Legacies of War uh, on all our social media, our website, legaciesofwar.org. And David, for people who want to follow and support the bill uh, that you're planning to put forward? Yeah, they can find the, the information on United Royal Lao Veterans.org. So this is an organization that was created by Paulun Kao. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Briggs here representing the uh, Allied Coalition Veterans Forces as well too. So neither of these, uh, either of these gentlemen uh, are available for a consult. And of course you can find me on Facebook as well too for a follow-up conversation. There's one minute left and so I'd love for our uh, two speakers who served for us, you know, so who fought for us. Um, and to your point, David, you know, the reason why many of our Lao American families are here, if you could leave us with a, a message of hope. So maybe, a, a, you know, just in this one minute, we will begin with uh, Paulun Kao, just a, a, a short message of hope. I hope that the youngest generation, you know, both American or Lao to come and help us, look about us, how we suffer during the war. And I wish that the politician here understand us. You know, war is very terrible. No one need war now. I feel like war, you know, I, I feel like i guilty too. I asked the asteroid to bomb, drop the bomb all over Lao, PDJs, Savannah Cade, Ho Chi Minh Trail. I asked sometimes 215 USB 52 to drop about me, around me on Park Song and you know, too many bombs. I you know, I, I feel guilty, too, but I need your help to support us, to support Lao veterans, you know, who, who did a lot of sacrifice during the war and then most of our people are veteran they they own cry now when we talk about the past they say i won't cry i got wounded i was cut here no one you know tried to help us so we feel really disappointed we need your help thank you and the last words from you tom just some a message of hope very quickly i hope that we can get uh, the money, the United States government will provide the money to legacies of war to achieve their goals. I also hope that the U.S. government would give an equal amount of money for the Lao veterans and all the sufferers and the seven generations of them here who will suffer equally. In other words, equal and fair. 
Well, thank you all for joining us and thank you to our speakers today. Today you heard from Thomas Briggs from Colonel Cal, King Sing Siang Mai, and also Sarah Kulabdara and David Pomavong, uh, who are all doing great work. For more information or to see more events that we have coming up at the Commonwealth Club, you can head to commonwealthclub.org. Thanks again for joining us and spending your afternoon with us. We'll see you next time. <laughs>